Hello, everyone, and welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight, the Bedigal people of the Aura Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to welcome the Australian Institute of Architects members, UNSW students, alumni and friends from industry to our final Utsun for the year, the 2019 Donald K. Turner Address and the AIA Gold Medal Lecture. This lecture, held in partnership with the Australian Institute of Architects, features the Institute's 2019 gold medalists, Hank Kerning and Julie Eisenberg. They are both founding principals of the Santa Monica-based architectural firm Kenning Iceberg, and so welcome tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge that this event at UNSW has been made possible thanks to Donald, the Donald K. Turner Endowment Fund, established to honour him and his contribution to modern Australian architecture. So it's a fitting, a fitting um, lecture that we align the gold medal lecture and the endowment. The Institute's gold medal recognizes distinguished service by architects who have produced work of great distinction that has advanced architecture or endowed the profession in a distinguished manner. It's absolutely the highest accolade that can be received or endowed on a person or partnership. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Hunk and Julie on receiving this prestigious award for their lifelong pursuit of social and community outcomes through their work. At UNSW Built Environment, it's our ambition to shape future cities, cities that are equitable, inclusive, sustainable, resilient, and of course, much more than that, through our research and teaching. And we work towards improving people's lives through a better built environment. So I'm particularly pleased tonight to feature the work of these two Australian architects who have made this very much part of their vocation over the previous decades, working with underprivileged communities on creating architecture of social relevance, meaning, and inclusion. And as the Dean of UNSW Built Environment, as well as the President of the Australian Institute of Architects, I'm delighted to bring together our Built Environment community to celebrate Hank and, Kurt and Julie's achievements, and also to acknowledge and showcase their impact on the world through architecture, education, and advocacy. So before I hand over to both of them to speak to you tonight, I'd like to go through a little brief bio of each of them, because it's quite terrific. Julie Eisenberg is founding principal and has given visibility to the design value and potential of community projects in, people or in their people-oriented practice. Her focus on the user experience, whether an individual, community, or the public at large, brings an empathetic perspective that underpins how the firm transforms mundane programs into places of ease and generosity. Julie teaches around the world and has been a frequent advisor to the US Mayor's Institute on, design, on City Design and, outspoken, and an outspoken advocate on the value of social impact design. She is a board member of Public Architecture, the School of Architecture at Taliesin, and FYI Films. Hank Koenig, also a founding principal of Koenig Eisenberg, demonstrates how constraints like regulations and budgets can become springboards for innovation. Hank's encyclopedic knowledge of code and construction underlies his inventive approach to design, an unusual pairing which brings conventional stereotypes to inspire colleagues and staff alike. His community involvement and planning expertise includes seven years of service on the Santa Monica Planning Commission, and as a member of the US Green Building Council, Hank continues to lead the effort in integrated sustainable design and provides ongoing voluntary advisory work for the city. So I think that's a fitting introduction, and now I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And, uh it's quite an honour to receive this very prestigious award and be included uh, amongst many great architects uh, that have received this before. I'm going to give a, a brief history of Julia and myself in here uh, so that uh, and she's going to talk about our work later, but uh, hopefully this will give you a little sense of uh, where we're from, uh, why we think the way we think and why we do the things we do. Um, so this is us, just a few years ago. <laughs> That's me on the right. Um, now I wanted to be an architect since I was three. Uh, Julie didn't know what she wanted to do 
until much later. Uh, part of the reason for this is that my dad was a builder, a hard-working, sometimes stubborn Dutchman. Uh, and this, yes. is, this yes. is it continues our family home with, with Dutch Australian decor, and he would he would bid on homes uh, designed by architects, and he'd, back then you'd get the blueprints, a set of blueprints, uh, and uh, I would take my dough and pencils and I would colour them in. They were my colouring books, and I, I really liked the sort of representations of stone and brick and glass. Uh, particularly wood with the wood grain that you do. And I tried to colour and stay in the lines and use the right colours. And then he would return those blueprints to the architect, as you did back then. And the architect would get beautifully coloured, well, I thought they were beautifully coloured, uh, blueprints before we even had colour printing. Uh, we would also go out and uh, look at model homes by A.V. Jennings. I don't know if you have them here, but they were a big builder down there. Or, or uh, Merchant Builders, um, which is the one on the left, which even back then I kind of preferred. Um, actually, what I was doing was, at that time, I was about 13, I actually started drafting up plans for my dad for homes that he was building, for either custom homes for clients or spec homes, and that's why we were touring these things. Um, and uh, then on school summer holidays, I'd have to help him build these homes. That's, that was our summer camp. Um, when I was 16, or thereabouts, he bought a block of land on the Mornington Peninsula in Sorrento, and he, for some strange reason, let me actually design something. And so I did this uh, 10 metre by 10 metre A-frame with this full height glass wall looking at the wonderful uh, Mornington Peninsula tea tree. And then uh, it had a, a concrete block bedroom wing that interpenetrated this a-frame, so you had the solidity of the cinder block interpenetrating that wonderful lightweight structure. Not that I knew any of this stuff, or what those words meant, I just kind of liked that stuff. And then, of course, I had to help him build it, so I have a really good understanding of all the challenges that an architect can bring. So when, I started, when I started architecture at Melbourne Uni, I, I did know a fair bit about building. I, I wouldn't say I knew that much about design and architecture. And then, first day of architecture, I met Julie. And she was the, the opposite of me. She, she didn't know she even wanted to be an architect when she applied. She was told by one very enlightened faculty member, well, look, if you don't know what you want to do, architecture's a great education, great all-round education, and you can do all sorts of things with an architecture degree. Uh, her dad was in ladies' underwear. He made ladies' underwear. Oh, sorry, I, have to say I always this every get that wrong. time. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly enough, Julie, she she had a great eye. She knew she had a knack for all things design. Somehow, I don't know. She read books. Um, you didn't. That was a big difference. Yeah. Yep. And and Julie was not afraid to express her opinions uh, no. that way. And uh, you know, we actually kind of hit it off. We still do today sometimes. Right? If you keep going, right. yeah. Okay, so then uh, this was one of our first little projects. It was a, a little accommodations for a festival in, in Sunbury that had to be built in a, in a day on site. And it slept nine people, if you liked each other. Um, so that was one of the first things we did together. Um, and back then, Melbourne Uni was, uh, the course there was a five year program of a prac year. And uh, a lot of people went over to England during their prac year and they'd go there, work, and then uh, buy a Range Rover, bring it back home, and that would pay for the whole trip. Uh, we didn't do that. We stayed in Melbourne. And uh, I actually worked for this guy, Hank Romain. He was one of the architects that I covered the plans of many years ago. Uh, and this was his house. Uh, and I was working on residential projects, mostly single family homes. Julie actually worked for the public works department and was working on inner city schools. And, uh, so I think this bit was a chunk. Oh, there it is, that bit she was doing. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, she was one of the first females allowed on a public works construction site. The big issue back then was how, how would a female use the job site dunnies? 
and with so, dignity. With dignity. So they finally resolved it and allowed her to go uh, onto the job site. Uh, we did our, our final year thesis project together with, uh, this was Steve Ashton. Um, and we did it with Steve, Julie, and myself. Uh, and uh, it involved the uh, preservation and development of the Rialto building site on Collins Street. It was a wonderful, wonderful old building on Collins Street. Um, and uh, these are some of the drawings we did. You can see the T-square holding the drawings down while we took a, a bad photo of it. Um, we then also helped form the uh, the Collins Street Defence Movement, which was a group that to encourage preservation of these wonderful buildings. Um, uh, Evan Walker, who became a Minister of Planning in, um, in Melbourne, was one of the people involved in that. Obviously, Julie worked at, uh, well, we'll get to that. But anyway, uh, and, and preservation was important to us back then, and it still is today. We're involved in a lot of uh, uh, projects involving uh, preservation of historic buildings. We graduated. And uh, I, I got a job at uh, Max May's office. This is Max May. Uh, Ian McDougal was in the office at the time. Uh, we had many So we seem to work with everyone from Ash and Rugg at McDougal. Yeah. We, we, we should have joined them. They seem to have <laughs> gone on to bigger and better things. Uh, we had many a lively discussions, yeah. Ian and myself, about architecture. Um, Julie, and we were, again, working on residential projects. Julie worked uh, with Jackson and Walker. Uh, on institutional projects. Um, and this was their office. They had a wonderful conversation pit. And the, uh, the telephone, it was where Daryl Jackson sat and uh, Evan sat next to him uh, in an open office, um, no separate offices. And that's a model that we've continued to do today. We like to have an all-inclusive office where everybody can hear everybody else yelling at the contractors. Um, we also helped form the Half Time Club. Uh, and it happened around our kitchen table uh, with Grant Morani, Ian McDougall was involved and others. And then we, we moved into some grotty pub in Carlton. I'm not sure that was it, but that's an image of a pub in Carlton. Um, and then out of that, the transition magazine started. Um, because we hadn't left to do our prac year overseas, after working a couple of years, we felt the urge we should go somewhere. Um, and experience uh, architecture overseas. Uh, back then, England was a little bit dead. Um, the economy wasn't good. Architecturally, it wasn't that interesting. So we ended up getting accepted in a master's program at UCLA. And then we went to uh, Los Angeles. And at that time, it was a small city of uh, 3 million people. The county was 7.5 million. Uh, it was absolutely dreadful for three months. I would have returned home in a heartbeat if I could. But then we found all the good bits, all the different ethnic neighbourhoods. So it's really a, is a city, as Rainer Bannum said. Uh, he said four ecologies, but it's really a whole bunch of different ethnic communities that make it a very interesting city. And um, but it was, a, you know, from a planning point, it was a terrible city. So we said, well, this must be a really ripe field for uh, for some young architects. So uh, we stayed on. Uh, UCLA was fantastic. I uh, highly recommend uh, to folks doing a, uh, a postgraduate course. Uh, the two years were great. Uh, it took us a while to realize that the chair of the department back then, Bill Mitchell, was actually an Australian and had gone to Melbourne Uni. Uh, he was that adept at adjusting his accent to uh, American accents. Um, Bill, at that time, Bill, he and Charles Moore were writing a book, The Poetics of Garden, and we got to prepare many drawings for that book, such as this, one that you see here, this is Villa Lante. And then after drawing those drawings, we went and visited the gardens to see how well we did. Uh, I would recommend doing it in the other order, but that was not the case. Um, UCLA was interesting at the time too because we actually got to work on uh, real projects. Um, uh, they had a group called an Urban Innovations Group where faculty could bring in projects that they may get and have students working on. So um, we worked one uh, on, a, on a project which looked at how to make positive 
uh, urban development around the station locations of the then proposed subway in LA. We worked on the Fairfax district, which was the heart of the Jewish community. And then we also worked on this competition uh, for downtown LA uh, with uh, Charles Moore, Frank Geary, Larry Help, and many folks. Uh, back in the day, you had to submit colored package, 10 sets of drawings. Um, no colour copiers then, so we had to pass a colouring test using pencils. We're graduate students and we're... Can you colour well? It's... Anyway, um, our thesis project at UCLA was not actually a design project. We did a, uh, a research project was the development of 3D shape grammars, basically an algorithm that generated 3D uh, designs of Frank Lloyd Wright prairie houses. This was 1980. We didn't have computers to do the grunt work. It was all basically done by hand. Uh, when we presented this in our final presentation, uh, we a lot of derision from the uh, design faculty because they said this was somehow immoral, that we are taking design away from designers. So in this era of using parametric scripts to do some of your design work, we've come a long way from that attitude back then. Uh, where was I? All right. Uh, we graduated and a, a job fell in our laps and so we started the business, believe it or not, in a two-car garage. I mean, how, well, how LA is that, you know, two-car garage? Um, and so we started out doing design build projects. This was one of our first ones. And, and I had forgotten, we have some people from the States that turned up tonight. One of them's Annie Kelly, who's married to Tim Street Porter. And I had forgotten these are here. And uh, Tim Street Porter, was one of those people who, if he liked what you had done and you were a young architect, he would go photograph it for you. And he wouldn't charge you. And this was one of the things that gave us a leg up and allowed us to get things published and noticed. So, yeah, given you're here, Annie, thanks to Tim. Uh, anyway, so, so that, that's where we were. When we started the business, and I'm gonna let Julie tell you now about uh, what the business is about and the projects we do. Thank you. All right. And I'll interrupt you too. I'm sure you will. <laughs> so over the, over the years we were there, and just so you know, we didn't leave Australia because we didn't like it. We just had this five-year plan that we'd be back, and each year it was a five-year plan, and we never, got, we never made it back. Um, but we spent a lot of time observing, and the things that we were trying to work out is how to make sense of life lived. You're always interrupting. <laughs> He oh, it's did. his fault, I see. Um, and what the architectural opportunities were. So let me give you a little more context. Hank Sauter to talk about it. Um, the playground. The playground was Los Angeles. Um, in 1979, when we arrived in the city, Hank told you how big it was. In 2018, the population of the city is 4 million. The county is 10 million, roughly. And the region is 19 million. We've been filling in, but we've also been growing out. I didn't expect when we came to LA, I knew there was going to be like the tyranny of the car and suburban sprawl, but what I didn't expect was the art. So this is Ruscha and Hockney, and I didn't expect the architecture. I, you know, I came pretty ignorant. Um, so Eames and Gary, this is full-fledged Gary there, but he was already very influential when we came. And then the mess, and frankly, I fell in love with the mess. Um, the strip malls, uh, as Hank said, the ethnic neighborhoods, the, the freeways, I mean, anyone read Joan Didion? You should, because it you know, puts freeways in a good light. I know it's not the thing we should be doing now, but there was such an energy and a vitality and a mess and a need for stuff. Coming from Melbourne, which seemed so polite to us at that point, like, why, they've got no problems. This place has got real problems. And we looked for the cracks in the careless growth. And this is John Baldessari, and this is kind of my sort of guideline. It's called measuring with a coffee cup for obvious reasons. And his studio is a mess. And he's kind of, you kind of get the feeling that if you just move the coffee cup, you can see stuff a different way. And that was essentially the sort of uh, attitude we brought to what we were looking at. And then we started to do things. And we took whatever opportunity came our way. We looked at affordable housing that architects thought wasn't interesting. Uh, we did uh, design build for a lifestyle that was not being accommodated. We revived interest in maligned 50s and 60s architecture. 
like uh, you'll see a couple of hotels that way. Um, we looked at how things were built. We integrated sustainable strategies before it was fashionable or even taken seriously. Uh, look at, looked at ways to deinstitutionalize community and cultural settings from schools to museums. I have a healthy distrust for authority, which gets back to my father in ladies' underwear. He quit school in eighth grade, and he, he had a problem with anything that uh, put him in a, uh, a position where he felt controlled and that you needed special knowledge. So I was very hypersensitized to that situation. And dealing in LA, the idea of being an outsider was very handy. I actually think being an outsider is a creative position. I know that's not a popular point of view in Australia, but I think it's very important that people come with fresh eyes. I think they add to how you see a place. So anyway, that's, that's that part of the story, which brings us to, remember the title at the beginning was improv? Well, part of this story is about the seat of the pants. I mean, if you can't get a work permit and you can work for yourself, you work for yourself. Um, so then there's the other part of improv. Anyone follow comedy? So you know the rule in improv comedy is you can't say no but. You have to say yes and. And I feel when we're looking for a career arc to talk about what we did, we figured yes and was the best way to describe it. I, oh, it's my turn, yeah? No, it's my turn. Okay. My turn. OK, so uh, some examples of the sort of idea of yes and. Uh, so this was our, our studio building, which we, we really had to build on a shoestring. So we elected not to do uh, subterranean parking, but to build the parking as a tuck under parking situation. Uh, this was done in 1999. And uh, so it was really done around zoning code and efficiency, cost efficiency. And our kids, who were smarter than us, as we drove them by the site when we, we found it, they said, you better do something good because people are going to look at this. It's like, OK, we get it. There's pressure. Uh, and the other part of that formula is that you want to make a place where people feel welcome and involved. And that's the core of our practice has been a pretty collaborative practice. And uh, there's our team. And uh, uh, we have two partners, Brian Lane and Nathan Bishop, and a whole bunch of people who it's fabulous to think with. Uh, so another example, uh, Julia mentioned... Uh, you know, Richard McKinnon is here, I think. Am I right? Is that Richard? No, it looks like Richard. He's okay. another planning commissioner in Santa Monica, so I wanted to make sure that I didn't lie in front of another planning commissioner, but this yeah. is true. Um, so this was a, a project we did. Uh, as Julia mentioned, I was on the planning commission. This was for another commissioner as a house. So we started off diligently with the zoning envelope because we didn't want to screw that up. Uh, so this was the zoning envelope that we created, um, and? And so the trick is that Hank was always looking for ways to use those planning parameters well. So that was always a game that he liked to play. Um, other people play football, but Hank does this. And what, what we were trying to do then was, wow, for the first time, the planning code works in our favor. We have a client that has an affection for the rural and the informal. So when the barn came out, it's like, why not? Um, got a little flack from friends who thought this isn't a modern building, but hey, that's OK. And then uh, they had a portrait of a great, great aunt who was a Quaker. a Quaker. And I liked the bonnet. And I said, Hank, can we do the bonnet? And so, oops, we did the bonnet. <laughs> so that was the accessory building and uh, that we had at the back with accessory living quarters. And people would say, well, that's just a garage. Yeah. Why, why did you bother making it so beautiful? We said, well, because you sit in the house looking at the garage. You don't sit in the garage looking at the house. Uh, so that's our little folly in the, in the backyard. And the final example of this kind of thinking is the uh, John Adams Middle School. So this one is a, uh, for a school district who said, we want this to be a showcase of sustainability. Um, and we, so we immediately dumped the air conditioner. Um, LA has a big program of air conditioning going and retrofitting. We said, well, screw that. Let's do something. Where we don't have the air conditioner, we're in the, we're in the most benign climate of the mainland USA. Uh, it's probably more benign than here, I think. Um, so we did that. We put in uh, solar chimneys uh, that would earth induce a draft and have uh, uh, air coming in through earth tubes underground. Uh, so if you're going to use sustainability, it'd be really great if the kids got to see what it did. So the form became the design idea, so the chimneys gave that. 
and uh, it was a heuristic for teachers to use to talk about differential air pressure. Which brings us to sort of the other part that we found that we were doing, we didn't know we were doing, and then finally put together in a book in uh, 2007. And it's really about the idea of what if we view architecture as a social medium. So we started to collect ideas of what we'd been learning. And we learned that if you want to engage everybody, if you want to make an inclusive place, the three kind of key things you need is trust, ease, and fit. And that begins by engaging people. And in that book, I think it was the first time this had been done, I don't know, but I'm, I'll, I'll take a risk on it. Um, we did portraits of the people who used our buildings and got comments from them. And it was to make the statement that it starts with the people. Many years later, we came back to this, and I'm thinking, boy, I don't really know what are the tools that we use to make this real. So transparency seems obvious, so that you can see what you're getting into. If you're, you know, put my dad there, do I go in there or don't I? Will I be welcome or won't I? So if you can see, that's a big deal. Choice. If you want people to feel in charge of a situation, you give them choice. You can go this way or that way. There is no mistake here. Uh, make a mess. I'm a big believer that a place shouldn't be so precious that you can't touch something, you can't do something, you can't make something. And discovery, again, if you find it, you own it. So the idea of sequence of spaces is very important for us. The other part of the toolkit is informality, a logical you know, offshoot of ease. It's to do with the plan flow again, material selection. We have a real love of very simple, cheap materials. Uh, daylight, we know it improves a sense of well-being. It's now part of the wellness lexicon. Imperfection again, really a take on making a mess. And the idea of a loose fit, and probably the best example for that is a good pair of jeans. And then if you go to context, it was about time to start thinking about context as more than place. It wasn't about what was built next door and what material it was. It was about a social resonance you could make between things, about open-ended narrative that people could interpret in different ways. It's about the idea of sticky spaces, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the idea of sustainability, because if you start thinking of everything as local, that's a big mistake. It's a small planet. And then if you want people to feel dignified, you need to treat them with the same respect. You need to give messages that it's personal, that it's something from us as the architect to you as a user of the building. And it's sort of pretty obvious in there. So I'll talk a little bit about sticky spaces. Sticky spaces is a term that my partner Nathan Bishop came up with. It's to promote connections between nested scales of community, from home to neighborhood and in between. So, a couple of years ago, we did another book. Well, this is a pizza box with some broadsheets in it, but it's a book. Um, expanding on the idea of neighborhood and the idea of the ideal of local and the friction that was happening around change in Los Angeles. But that's another story. So we look at the pretty picture of LA. That's one thing. If you look at multifamily housing as a development community had delivered it to us over the years, post-war housing has three big types. I did, this is the, the pocket version to multifamily housing, the dingbat, the six pack, and the single and double podium. And they correspond with increasing value of property, the impact of seismic code, uh, the cheapest way to build in LA, which is wood frame, and the prominence of the car and how it peaked and is actually now dropping back. But you can see how it impacts the form. And at the street level, it looks more like that. It's a little disappointing. And the sticky spaces are missing. The spaces that connect the housing to the street, from the, the, na the people within a building to each other, all of those kind of stuff, was stuff we're starting to get kind of frustrated with. And then uh, we thought, well, maybe in a project like 500 Broadway, which is in the city of Santa Monica, a very progressive city, slow on the car, but really fast on everything else. Um, and we got this project called 500 Broadway which is now in construction about seven years later. So I don't want to discount a robust community process, but I'm not going to talk about it tonight. Um, and it was about trying to make methods that connected people who live in the building to the street below, or formally trying to work out what you could do with retail so that it wasn't just that thing that was stuck under the building, right under the concrete level and the housing above. And this sort of started with Hank and his nifty little 
analysis kind of deals. Um, and we'll stick with the sticky theme. This is a donuts versus churros. The planning code was very happy with donuts, didn't allow churros. And we realized with this project particularly that it worked much better sustainably for breezes and views and other reasons and connections to the ground if we were allowed to do churros. You are now allowed to do churros in Santa Monica and you can thank us. Um, part of the development of this project was the re-establishment of LA as having a, a public transportation system. And the streetcars which had uh, defined the cities in the 20s and the teens that took people to development sites out in the periphery had all disappeared in the 50s due to the oil and car interest. And for the first time in about, what, two years ago, hmm. there was a line that took you from downtown LA about 20 miles, 25 miles inland to the beach, which is Santa Monica. And uh, it's called the Expo Line. And this is the terminus of the Expo Station. And that put a lot of pressure on this real estate, and rightly so, to get more density and more use. As the region of LA was absorbing more housing and actually more on the fringe, uh, cities like LA were, were doing a bit better and cities like Santa Monica were not increasing the number of units in proportion uh, like they should have. So this is all for the better. Uh, that blue line is the, the walk from the expo line to the neighborhood. Um, and then sort of some of the studies we were doing to work out how things fitted together, how we could connect uh, the housing to the street. Uh, we also, given the opportunity with the budget, because we didn't often do the market rate, we were more often doing the affordable, it's like, could we play with the plasticity? I mean, it was so boxy, the form that had become the sort of standard in LA. And working from the pragmatic premise that if we faceted the building, we could get more views, which means you could get more value for the units, we had buy-in from the developer. And you can also see in that other image that we're also interested in, in light and shadow from shading and privacy screens, which to me is part of the great gift that sustainability gave us. It legitimized our ability to make pattern and ornament. And it's sort of coming along. Uh, it started construction two or three months ago. No, we couldn't do it in wood frame in the traditional sense. This is a moment frame construction which allowed us the affordability to get this built. Uh, and it's going to hopefully look like this. And you can go and buy your vittles there when you come. Uh, and it's a string of open space that adds on to the private space. So I said, go ahead, you're going to interrupt, aren't you? No, I just want to say that's 240, 249 units. Uh, Santa Monica has three times as many jobs as it does um, units, apartments or residents, I should say. So, so the need for housing in Santa Monica, but in LA in general. Is that a crisis point? A crisis point, we can't build enough housing, right, to satisfy the demand that's needed. So it's a combination, as Julie said, there is still sprawl, but we need to infill and infill on sites that aren't currently, don't have housing on it, because we don't want to displace people in existing housing, because that tends to be workforce housing. Anyway. That gets to a whole other issue. So uh, the city of Santa Monica uh, requires inclusionary affordable housing, and that's what you're seeing at this next project, the Arroyo, which is built within a quarter mile radius as is required. It provides 25% uh, relative to the, so it's 68. Six, 64 units. 64 units of uh, large family housing. And this is to prove to you that we actually have a train that comes from LA down to the beach. But that's the project there in the background. But the site started as an arroyo, or as you would call here a gully, or we would call here a gully. And then it was the train track for that line that went to downtown LA. And then in the 60s, it became a stormwater tunnel nine foot across, which, you know, fast forward, became an advantage for our client, uh, a not-for-profit uh, developer that partnered with the market rate developer to buy the site because the market rate developer didn't know what to do with that storm drain relative to the parking required. And that's the path here between the two buildings is that storm drain. And uh, it became a place for parking. So the churro works here again. I mean, it's not like you go to rich people and do one thing and you go to people with limited means and you do another. Some of the same strategies still apply, but what you're getting as a community good is different. Whereas a view may be more valuable 
for a um, for a single person with, with who wants a really fancy apartment, when you've got large families, where the places to play and all that kind of stuff is huge. And a lot of care is taken with, between us and the client group and a lot of other architects in LA working in the affordable housing market to make sure that we provide the most on every site. And then in this case, the bridges connect the levels and that creates a a degree of sticky space of connection that you can see your mum upstairs and you can wave as you're downstairs. All of these things, they seem so sort of common sense, but we don't do them. We don't do them as much as we should. And then that open space to the street, as they fill it in, as that street gets filled in, because you saw all that construction that was going around, that will give a breather space back to the boulevard. And there's that ornament again. Well, the utility and ornament. Ashland Apartments is on a different scale, and I thought it might be interesting. You do a lot more of it in Sydney and in Melbourne than we get to do in LA. It's actually, what we, it's got the name Missing Middle. It's meant to be Missing Middle in terms of affordability. However, the land in LA is so expensive, it's basically less expensive Missing Middle. It's still needed, and there aren't a lot of, of uh, uh, opportunities to do it. So this is off, it's just down the road from the other two. And it's a, a set of uh, little houses that sort of mimic in a, micro, you know, in, a, in a small way the idea of California lifestyle. Each of them has a big outdoor space. Each of them is connected in the way that was developed in the courtyards of the 30s and the 40s by, um, by Schindler and by Irving Gill. And so we drew on that tradition to make a place that had a community space for the people who lived in the building and private space. And uh, we disguised the cut into the hill. It's basically a building on a parking garage. Um, the building on the boulevard that's going to be lower down will, will uh, cover this elevation altogether. And as you come in, and properly riding around town on a bike, not in a car, right? Um, you get to a place where you meet you get to front fences and front gates, which changes your, your understanding of what the space is, and you now have a sort of a hillside community, and no, ba no side yard space is thrown away and becomes private space for each of the units. So I'm rushing through because I always go too long, and I want to talk about, if you talk about community, one of the strongest ideas that we have as a society is the idea of a library. With the advantage of, being, of access to knowledge, you um, you can change uh, opportunity. And uh, there was a guy, Andrew Carnegie, who was the great industrialist. He did a lot of things that we just, we'll just not talk about them for now. But he also endowed a library system which took the idea of a free library to communities as far away as Australia. But so anyhow, we ended up with a couple of projects with this theme, so I collected them together and thought I'd just talk about them a little bit. So there's the idea of the neighborhood and the home and the library and that opportunity. And here's the first Carnegie Library in the country in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has snow and cold. Uh, it was a very polluted town. The steel industry has now disappeared completely. And uh, this is on the north side. And it had the plan with the structural stacks. So the books were kept in stacks where the actual bookshelves held up the floor. And uh, you would ask the librarian to get you the book, that kind of thing. And think about it. At that point in time, all knowledge is in physical things. It's in books made out of paper that are a valuable asset and should be revered. And that's the kind of personality of the place. And you can see the seating and the sort of setup and that it was well ornamented and it was well crafted. Tiffany ceiling. Pardon? It had a Tiffany. And it had a seat. Tiffany ceiling, yeah which you can see Which somebody stole. Yeah, it, it was gone. So by the time we get there a uh, hundred years forward, we'd done a work for the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh where we joined a 1880s post office to a 1940s planetarium with an addition to make the largest uh, children's museum in the country at that point. The uh, planetarium building had been vacant for about 15 years and just sat there. And the Carnegie Library, similarly, just sitting empty. And there's nothing worse for an urban environment than vacant buildings. 
And Jane had this theory that when you uh, make places for children, you actually take back the city and you reduce crime rates. And it's turned out she's right. Anyhow, so she comes through and then she says, Julie, come back and help us. We want to turn this into what we're calling the museum lab. When you work in children's museums, you're dealing with informal education, you know, from zero to, um, to 10. Let's see what we can do with the teens. They'd already been starting to roll out a program with Google taking maker spaces into classrooms. So the city gives her the building, and we get to work on the museum lab. Uh, we didn't change much in terms of the building configuration. The blue bits are pieces we added, and actually that blue piece is above what was the Tiffany ceiling, because the Tiffany ceiling had disappeared. So let me show you what we found. Well, no, wait, I'll show you the new bit. It's much more interesting than what we found. Now I'll show you what we found. Um, on the left, I have problems with left and right. Have I, have I got this right? Yes. Yeah, on the left um, is what we found. And there had been some fantastic additions done in the 60s, as you can tell, which had completely destroyed the character. But we, in our innocence, thought, oh, the stuff that was there will be below. We knew the stair was gone. But actually, that was all gone when they put the drywall wrappers around the arches, they actually sliced off the columns. And we realized that our job was actually to stabilize the building. We still believe we should take it back. Um, but that meant not just going to the skin of what was around there originally, but going to the bones. So we decided to strip it back till a stable part. The mortar had crumbled the whole nine yards. And then we thought, wow, if we're talking about a place of discovery, maybe this is a really strong sensibility to go with. And we went with it. Um, who knew that those fantastic armatures were underneath column capitals, which were so you know, pretty and ornate? Um, and that's how they were held on. What you're seeing in the background is a screen that was made out of the structural uh, library floors for the stacks. So this is, you know, this is, the, this is what the ceiling was when we got to it. Uh, this is what it had been, which we were talking about. What we did is we did add a skylight, and I'll show it to you in a minute, but uh, you can see what happened to that lovely reading room. Uh, and that when stripped back, we just kept putting just gestures of what was there, and then we got, we collaborate a lot. And this was with Freeland Buck, who did the, uh, the sort of Tiffany glass fabric cut ceiling. For those of you who are still worried about digital technology and craft, I think we've got to get over it, guys. It's, it's time to realize that it's not how you make it, it's how you think about how you make it. And this is a beautiful installation. And that's looking back into that reading room that I showed you. Some of the program space and things that they do. Going upstairs, we think they should make this into a place where we can stay for the weekend, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and then the new space that was added in the light well of the building, a uh, pretty light touch of what was added new. And as it turns out, when we were there, this is a week and a half ago, it was a great place to get married. So fast forward, and we're talking about a new library in a park in Santa Monica. So you put a library in a park. The traditional way of a library in a park was uh, you put it in a quiet place. but it's a different era, and they get back to this issue of choice. Um, the issue of choice means that what you want to do is make people feel like they choose to come to the library, not that they have to go to the library. We are appealing to a population that felt that there had been a consistent and persistent achievement gap in their neighborhood, and the figures supported it. And they wanted a place that would attract families. Uh, the core groups were Latino and African American families, and the library was, is one of those places, so that is also very interesting. People will play with different socioeconomic groups outside in a park. They will also go to a library together. It's one of those key places where different economic and ethnic groups mix. And so they were park programs. So we figured, OK, what if we start thinking about how modern families operate? The more we could bump into other programs, the better off we were you know, from the farmer's market to the teen program to the basketball. This wasn't about a place that was quiet. This was about making a living room for the neighborhood, as the community had asked us to do. And that plays out sort of formally in this set of diagrams, but 
we'll keep moving. And then we get to the idea of sustainability. And the ceiling was carved to bring light into the library because I don't know what you're noticing, but I'm certainly noticing that the idea of a glass front doesn't work unless there's light behind, especially with the tinted glasses we're pushed to use. So unless you bring light in behind, you can't see in. So if you want people to see in, light becomes a real big deal. It's also a really good idea from a, you know, daylight harvesting is a, a better energy use than uh, using artificial lighting. And that was the uh, design principle behind this library. So I'll roll you through. And then PVs are as much about making light and shadow as everything else, so you get a double whammy. Most, uh, a number of these buildings that I'm showing you are a, a lead platinum, which is a big deal in our neck of the woods. And I, can't, I still don't know what it is with the green star system, um, but it's the highest one you get. We're still not doing enough. We're still not doing quick enough. You all know that. Um, and I'm just sort of walking you through. And so the, the yes and on that one was, we, need, we had a fire lane, we used the canopy to uh, highlight the fire lane and turn it from being for cars to being for people. Inside, aspirational space, if you, again that issue, if you want people to feel like you want them to be there, you want to make something that's special and unique. And you can get some strange views from kids looking in the camera. Um, there's the farmer's market. It's okay to make a mess, it's okay to have bikes at the entry. It's okay, that's a deliberate addition that we have of an awning that's more like a market awning. So the idea of the temporary computers and the view out to basketball and the playground. So then we got to the idea of a library in a school, which was uh, interesting. Uh, UCLA, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So now we've got the issue of at home. So when I went to school, and a lot of you went to school sometime around when I went to school, um, you went to the classroom, you went to the library, you took the book and you took it home and you worked by yourself. And if you worked with others, that was cheating, right? So the whole issue of how you accomplished your work was about you independently responding to a teacher in a classroom. We're in an era now where what we're trying to encourage and what the school was trying to encourage was independent and collaborative study that matched where you would be going in the workplace and the way the workplace is working. Um, and so what happens when that happens at a school? We say, well, what if the library then becomes the core idea of the school and that it's all the connective tissue? So all of the classrooms basically circle the library and that's the place where you can hang out and work and that's the place where there are some books and it's kind of the concept that we call an open library because it wasn't secure. So we get to a point now we've got most information is online, so you don't, a library is the emotional connection with the books. It's not really something you need to have to store the books, so you, your books have a different role. So this is Geffen Academy at UCLA. Uh, about three or four years ago, uh, Geffen made a donation to uh, UCLA for them to open a high school, which they didn't have on campus. And it has, uh, it's a middle high school and it has 650 students and it was designed from scratch. The first person hired was the principal, the second was the assistant principal, and the third was the architects. So this was a real fun thing to work with and you're talking about a really great institution who likes to think outside the box at UCLA. And we worked with them. We got a project, a building that was designed by an architect we knew. Um, it had issues, it was in a parking lot, not so good. Um, so I'm going to sort of walk you inside. So we cleaned up the outside, did all the stuff you should do. And then we changed the, the, uh, the construct of the building from hallway to open library. And it has a lot of components and it works through three floors. And I quickly walk you through this. So the front, the, the, there's no lobby formally. That's a workspace that kids can use. The middle school is like that space. They like the connection from inside to out. They like that the furniture is different, that they can move it around. This is stuff anyone who's working in this sector knows better than I do. Um, the way the stair works, and actually to try and build a stronger connection with staff. So that's the staff room you're seeing on the right up there, and looking back from the staff room out. Different kinds of workspaces and study spaces and hangout spaces. Classrooms, of course. The, uh, the library collection sort of done Amazon style, flat on. 
there are other library places in the school. Uh, the coming back down, the other real key component of education at this point is wellness and getting kids better food and then not saying that food is something you have to do in a sloppy cafeteria, making it look more like a hip cafe. And the kind of spaces that we were talking about outside, inside happening outside. So I've got a couple of buildings I've got to r race through because I only have, I think, seven minutes. Um, I think one thing you didn't mention is that they didn't care if somebody took a book. Yeah. They actually thought if somebody takes a book home... All the better. All the better. Doesn't matter, we'll get a new book. So this is, so that, it works on that principle that you don't need to have that check out security. In fact, the other library we did, I hope nobody's here from Santa Monica, they've got those machines that you go out through. They don't work. <laughs> Shh, they're taping this one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, so 28th Street Apartments started life as a uh, YMCA for the African American community in South Los Angeles. And by the time we got to it, it's, it's uh, well, I need to point out this gentleman here, he's the architect, Paul R. Williams, and first African-American licensed west of the Mississippi, first African-American who was a fellow of the Institute. And this isn't just about being first, this is about being a really good architect who did these things as well. So he's an extraordinary person, and this is something he was doing for his community. And uh, you, just to give you the idea, in the 20s, we're talking about the era of segregation. So it's the only place you can get a room for the night. It's the only place you can play basketball. It's the only place you can swim in a pool. You get the picture? Pretty tough thing for a couple of white kids from Melbourne to be dealing with. And we were very aware of our uh, outsider status and what that meant. Uh, we worked closely with uh, the family. It, uh, Brian, my partner, was pretty involved in making sure that the Williams family uh, were okay with what we were doing and then there was interaction with the community as well. And so you can see what happened to this poor building. It's got stripped out. It was birds and broken glass and we brought a lot of it back. Um, the area of addition was in the back. We're in a seismic zone. The building is board form concrete. If you add any more, if you add more building on top, you really make it an expensive proposition to get the loads down without causing all sorts of problems. So this was the place we could add the extra units that were needed. Um, and there's the seismic joint, which cantilevers some units. Well, there's some dot here somewhere. Mm. Here we go, out over deck. And then the idea of the, using the roof space as a social space. Um, and then there was also youth programs happening in this building as well. I'm just gonna quickly keep moving. Then the idea of open-ended narrative. So the easy answer to this is just build the building so it looks like the other building, which we all know doesn't work. And in Australia, you're much more enlightened about how you add new to old. In this community, there's a story to be told and we needed to keep the narrative going, but in a way that we felt that would be uh, fresher and uh, more expressive and something to discover. And so we thought if we make a lightweight screen, which we used a lot on masonry buildings actually, as an ornament system, you would make this, the, uh, the concrete building seem heftier and weightier. So you would create a resonance between what you added new and what you had that was old. And we took inspiration from the volutes around this portrait of Booker T. Washington. There were other Afri prominent African Americans featured around the building. And what's really cool is that those tabs that come out catch the sunlight and make that volute pattern and at different times of day they disappear depending on how the light hits them. And so that seemed the right place to put the front door at the bottom. So if you want to be welcome home, you are welcomed home. What I forgot to tell you, which was kind of silly, is that this is now a project for, of supportive housing. So it serves uh, formerly homeless. It serves mentally ill. It serves kids coming out of foster care. And uh, they're a great organization that organized the, uh, these kind of accommodations. And it also provides support services to help stabilize lives. Uh, and it matters how you get your mail, how they get greeted by the, the manager, not through a dentist's window, but sort of person to person. It impacted how we treated spaces. And then that new sliver that we added at the back, behind that metal screen, is uh, 
uh, PVs hung vertically, photovolt uh, solar hot water on the roof. So we took systems and didn't burden the existing building with them. Um, and then more importantly is that, that flow with it. Here's the, uh, the laundry. So when you go to make that social roof space, going through to the laundry creates more opportunity that people will interact and create a sense of community and uh, socialize. I mean, I'm, we're talking about this because it's a supportive housing, but frankly, it matters just the same no matter how much money you make. So these are just issues of sort of principles of humanity that I think uh, are bigger than just the uh, one target uh, group of people. So that roof deck was that. And now I have to say something nice about Hank, which is to do with this nifty idea he came up with so that we could use the roof deck as a social space. We needed to put some mechanical equipment somewhere. He said, well, let's make a structure and hang it in the light well. Oh, well, he's a happy resident. Um, and the units, I'm moving through. This is what we found. I, I got ahead of myself, you can tell. We'll come back to it. And I'll still compliment him. Um, 28, so that's what it was like. We focus a lot when we do a, a restoration on ornament. I don't think we focus as no, um, enough, generally, about uh, composition. So there were three compositional strategies here. One was an interst interstitial floor that was built above the existing floor so that all of these spaces could keep their spatial uh, identity. It uh, was the, using the found space and Hank's nifty idea of hanging the, the mechanical equipment there. From here, you've got a different view of the building. And this mechanical, uh, the structure to hang the mechanical became an arbor that anchored the social space. This was a real yes and, this guy. Uh, so the, the historic spaces, the arbor, and the idea of adding new that is resonant and done with the same amount of care as the original. And finally, I'm going to end up with a student pavilion at Melbourne University. So who knew? Uh, we got a call while we were actually in the desert in uh, New Mexico from Kerry Lyons. And he said, you want to join a team? We're going after the student precinct at Melbourne University, which is where we went to school. Um, we lived here uh, when we were students. The student precinct was over here. Most of you probably know Melbourne. Although I, d I understand that Sydney doesn't like to go to Melbourne. It's OK. It's a nice place. Uh, food's good. Uh, it's this University of Melbourne's main campus. It now spreads all over the place here. Um, and what they wanted to do was improve the student experience, which, in truth, needed some improvement. I won't go into all of that story. But the part that's interesting was the structure of this project. So Lyons was the uh, executive architect. And they pulled together a team, I think it's called um, the diversity model of procurement. So you bring together a bunch of people with different emphasis and different skill sets, different levels of their career. You include uh, you know, emerging practices like NMBW. You include uh, Jeffa Greenaway, who's an uh, indigenous peoples architect. And you put these people together and you come up with a concept for the place, and then individual pieces are done by each firm. What's interesting about this is if you're talking about inclusiveness, and a lot of the students at Melbourne University come from all over the world, and uh, is that you're basically creating a sense of diversity with what you built that matches the profile of the students. And maybe there's some intelligence in that. Um, so anyhow, the student precinct, we got to do this little piece here which after what I've been talking about is probably no surprise. That's kind of the neighborhood building. So we got food service. Anyone go to Melbourne University remember the Road and White Library? You were probably there when we were there, stoned listening to music, right? It was the recreational library for the university, and still is. Um, and the record players are still there to prove it. Um, they were going to be located in there. And then I've been describing lately this top floor. So that's food and study, and this is study in Road and White Library. And then up here is, imagine you had a really wealthy aunt, and she built a 500 square yeah. meter, I think I've got this right, house, and said you could use it. So this is built to be very non-institutional space. It allows for student event space, and to hang out in a more casual, more, um, more domestic kind of setting. 
And the students were really keen that we talk about sustainability. And I forgot one really key part about the master plan. I'm just going to quickly touch on it, is that the landscape was going to be the, is the unifying concept here. And the unifying concept is about making uh, the history of the site pre-colonial times visible. So it's a reconciliation gesture. And it matters what it's built of. And it's been done with a lot of care. And Kerry Lyons, I think, can talk a lot more intelligently about this than I can, because I'm still at a distance coming from LA. And it has a pretty simple grid, except if you go in the other direction. And this was a chance for us to use concrete. This is uh, uh, prefab columns. In LA, it's, it's all wooden steel. So concrete's like a big, big thrill for us. Um, and it gets skinned. And the wood, which is black butt, I believe, in the siding. And then the idea that everyone is welcome and that there's a sense of discovery. And you can move. The major circulation of this building is on the outside. And it feels like this. Still uh, principles of sustainability with mixed mode spaces and conditioned spaces and sun angles and all the things we should be worrying about. And just giving you some pictures and then moving up and around what it is from the top, what it is from the south. And I guess um, I've talked too long, but I've really enjoyed sharing our work with you. Uh, I hope you understand the improv adventure we've been on now, and we'd be really happy to take questions. Thank you. Good job. Thank you for that. And um, I'd, I'd really like just to not only thank you and acknowledge you, but also um, summarize just some of the key points. I thought the fact that you were the outsiders was the key to your, your being, you mm -hmm. know, because you see the outside in and the inside out. And the, the interstitial spaces become the places where everything happens. And I don't think you could have done what you've done without that respect of the other being from the outside. I actually think it starts with being from a, a, a minority community in Australia not minority in any sense because we're disadvantaged, but I come from an Orthodox Jewish background and you were always a little odd. I went to MLC and there weren't that many of us at MLC. So it, it's always been sort of interesting to straddle both worlds. Hank's family came from Holland and they spoke Dutch at home and you know, we, he took funny bread to school. So we've, we experienced it within Australia and so it didn't feel like such a difficult position to be in going somewhere else. So I think, though, that that's also brought this generosity of spirit in yeah. all your work and in your architecture, which is often modest, but also very giving and generous. Well, thank you. And so um, I, I don't want to harp on, because I really wanted to uh, open the floor to questions. Thanks for a terrific lecture. I'm curious, now that you're back practicing in Australia, do you see there being any fundamental differences between architectural practice here and architectural practice in the US? I think architects have a lot more freedom in Australia than they do in the US. That's just like a bottom line. Do I need to add to that? <laughs> I think it's like, I'm so jealous. Um, it's amazing the level of experimentation that's, that happens here. You agree? Yeah, and when we left and started practice, Australia was so much ahead of the game in terms of sustainability. Um, they weren't really talking about that, but we had been talking about that at, at Melbourne, uh, obviously in terms of water conservation. Yeah. You guys are, are way ahead of the game. Uh, and I think some of, the, some of those things are, are, are embodied in the architecture. Because you, you, I think it kind of comes natural to you guys that you just think I that way. I don't think it's been uh, nurtured over the last 20 years as much as it should have been. I think given the head start, when we left, it's surprising that it feels like it's catching up again in many places, that the requirements on buildings are not as uh, stringent as they should be if we're going to really do anything about climate change. So I, I would say to everybody, uh, join those climate action plans and get serious about this. I think the other way is, I think, well, Santa Monica is a little bit an exception. We're a small city, 100,000 people. 
Um, they have a much more progressive attitude to affordable housing, uh, affordable housing production, uh, and now they're looking at that, what did term did you call the, uh, what, what I call workforce housing. Workforce housing. Right. Uh, it's great, you know, you've got affordable housing, you've got very wealthy housing, but what about our employees yeah. in the middle? Uh, that's the big challenge that they're tackling. Um, I'm guessing you've got the same problem here. Hmm. I was going to say, um, Platinum is six green stars. Is six green stars? Is that right? Yep. yep. Well, we actually need to be more carbon neutral. We're still not there yet. I mean, I think we're getting there, but... Could you, could There's a big up? pressing need for uh, sustainable, um, affordable housing in Australia at the moment. So uh, hopefully uh, you can be part of the action group to uh, push Australian government along with those agendas because we're well behind and uh, we need to start targeting those areas. So is that something you're looking into? We're not in looking into it here, but it's actually, it's, it starts with the money. Mm. So when we got into affordable housing in the 80s, part of the reason architects weren't interested in it was it, it was a marginalised area. Mm. But it was a time that was sort of luckily uh, innovative. The federal government had moved funding from a centralised source through the housing and urban development to not-for-profit uh, developers at the neighbourhood level. Those not-for-profit developers at the neighbourhood level could only operate if they could get money. And so some of that money was funnelled from HUD, but the way that they went around it was they introduced something called a tax credit, where people who wanted to get a, a cut on their tax could invest in funds that then subsidised affordable housing. And then there was money from cities. I mean, if you saw the application forms these poor people fill in to get funding for their projects, you would cry, what a waste of time. Um, it takes six or seven sources. Banks are required to give a certain amount of loans for affordable housing. So there are mechanisms, it's not fast enough. City of LA just passed, uh, the voters passed uh, Proposition HH, which put billions of dollars into housing, which is the first time that's happened in a long time. So it starts with the money, and then it comes with the innovation of the uh, housing providers. We're at a time where they're trying to, do, to catch up. So speed and scale is a huge issue. And what I'm worried about is speed and scale isn't good enough. Speed and scale, speed, scale and money, sorry, isn't good enough. What happened in the 80s with the, the not-for-profits meant that they were looking at it from the sustainable unit of the housing, how people fit into the community, and how they could stabilize lives over the long term. And if we lose sight of that while we're pushing for the other, we're not going to really solve the problem in the long term. Thank you. That was great. Um, one of the big things that's happened in Sydney over the last 15, 20 years has been um, the conversion of the entire area of the city, of the surrounding suburbs, that was um, all industrial, into housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, which included an enormous number of, um, I don't know what the percentage would be, but maybe 15, 20 per cent of conversions of old factories and what have you. Is there a similar thing happening in LA? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, so uh, uh, the area around uh, uh, the LA River, uh, that was an industrial area. Uh, and of course, it became the area where the artists move in, so it's called the Arts District. Um, uh, a lot of abandoned buildings because industry moved out. Uh, and then SIARC uh, moved in there. They were a big catalyst of change down there. Um, and now uh, we're seeing a lot of housing projects. We're seeing the likes of uh, Herzog de Marone and Bjarke Engels doing projects down there, proposing large projects. So it's going to change. And uh, we actually had one project many years ago that was going through the approval process. Um, and at that time it was uh, denied approval because they worried about uh, losing the uh, industrial uses. Um, so that project died, but then some other developer picked it up and somebody else designed it and it, now it's going to happen. So things change. I think they recognise that those industries aren't, aren't there. As much as they want them, they're not really viable. 
The same thing happened in Santa Monica, lost a lot of businesses. Uh, in there it used to be uh, uh, actually brick factories, quarries that were filled in mm. with Beverly Hills trash. But that's good Love trash. Beverly Hills oh, trash. It's good trash. But, uh, but anyway, now it's getting developed, but then they have to uh, mitigate the problems of the toxins in the soil, etc. So it, it's, it's something that we, we're seeing. Uh, the, the big question is how do you make it positive? How do you make a positive environment? Um, and I think one of the things, that, mistakes that people make, they make it too clean and neat and slick and there's no sort of grit, no, no vitality to it when you go to these areas. Are you worried about losing industrial space? Is that the... Oh, no. no. I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh. But the, the, uh, in New York, they, they are making sure that they zone some land industrial, even though there's a lot of pressure to convert. What they're doing, which I think is innovative, is through some of the not-for-profits and some of the super fund part, is to try and create, to stop thinking of industrial. Yeah, there's dirty industrial, but uh, to stop thinking of industrial as, as one sole thing, that you can make infrastructure and making visible, and you can connect the community to the things that serve them. And I think this is a very important step forward. So I have a soft spot for industrial uses, um, but the other pressure, and Annie, who I mentioned earlier, she lives in Hollywood. Or, or you still in Hollywood? Yeah. So one of the issues there is the densification is coming so rapidly that it's undercutting communities, and they're feeling very disrupted. Mm. Uh, I'm in two minds about it. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of housing happening in a long time, a lot of deferred maintenance on buildings. However, it allowed a lot of people to stay in place, and now they're just getting pushed out. So we've got a real problem with displacement as well. It's really, it's really tricky times. So the industrial is a better option than the... Uh, Ah, can I remind you that the value of community is a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, good to... There's, I think there's one, there's a question there. Um, could you s explain uh, your experience with the sort of pluses and minuses of the affordable housing model where you build a lot of expensive apartments in the bit next to the freeway and underneath is the percentage for the um, affordable housing. I know they're, they're, using, they're using that a lot in the States and they're talking about using it here and I just wanted oh, to know you're if you're... Are talking about poor door housing? I mean, so the, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me. You're saying that they build housing together. So developers build uh, I think a you, development. I think what she's talking about is inclusion and, and zoning. And you, is that what you're talking about? Yes, the and you include rezoning. a certain percentage yes. of the development oh, has to go. inclusion rezoning is yep. a good thing. Yeah. It's all a good thing, there are no negatives? There are negatives. So the good thing is we're getting some housing, but inclusion rezoning is not gonna catch us up. It's one of many strategies because it's gonna be 20%, it's not gonna be more than 30%. We did a project with the city where they pulled in development tenders for 50-50 because they had good property and they realized that the development value was worth it to them to build the affordable housing. And that community has been operating at 50-50 for five years now, seems to be fine. There's nothing wrong with a mix of incomes. So on the plus side, not a problem. If you allow inclusionary housing to be built off site, which is also a good thing, you can't put it, I thought you said under the freeway, which like freaked me out. No, you can't put the affordable housing under the freeway. That's not a policy that makes sense. But can you put it, as the Santa Monica people said, if you want to do affordable housing off-site, it needs to be in the same neighborhood. The same neighborhood is a quarter mile. No, you can't do that. Not allowed. Well, You're not allowed to segregate the housing relative to the income level. You can have well, a separate hey, project. No, you can't. Um, so, for instance, Santa Monica's base inclusionary housing requirement is 10% for a, a base development. If you want to get increased FAR height, it can go up. In the case we did, it was 26% of the units um, were affordable. We're doing other projects that have 15%. The rule is that affordable units have to be distributed through the project. Yeah. They can be smaller. They can be smaller. Um, they don't need the same level of finishes. And 
are you going to put them in the prime view location with a view of the ocean? No. Is that a problem? I don't believe so. The people I've spoke to in, the, in these projects are like, can you believe we live here right next to the ocean paying this amount of rent? This is fantastic. And they're so appreciative. Um, and don't forget, those people are actually paying and subsidizing those units. Okay? So the problem I have with uh, inclusionary zoning as the only mechanism for affordable housing is that the, or what I call the already haves, the people who are living here already, who have benefited from huge escalation of the units, are not paying a dime. You know what a dime is? Okay. Not paying tuppence. <laughs> oh, oh you boy, you are back in time. So, so that's the problem. <laughs> So Santa Monica had a, 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 a proposition on a ballot that said, look, uh, we want to we uh, put a tax on people who sell their property, a sales tax. You sell your home. You bought your home probably for 200 grand, and it's now worth 2 million. So we're going to tax you. And it was about, uh, worked out about 5 grand, OK? And you're leaving anyway, so it's not a huge thing. So. Um, and then they had a second part to it that said, if we pass that, it'll be used for affordable housing. Okay? So it went to there, got 64% of the vote. So the second part passed, but taxes have to be done with a supermajority of 66%. So, lost out. So it lost out. And this is, this is crazy. I mean, the majority of the people supported this because they recognised the importance of diversity and that we should share all share the burden, not just the new people coming in not just for the millennials, etc. So we still, we still have a long way to go. But I think it needs to be a shared burden of the community. Um, I think that we've probably run out of time for questions, but I think actually what you're getting from the audience is this kind of... They're interested in the same issue. Well, I mean, I think, you know, that's like 3% of our housing stock is affordable or low-income housing. Mm. So we are, yeah. and we, you know, we have, uh, no affordable housing policy, which is blanket. We have no inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. We're looking for every and any tools to actually uplift it's our affordable housing and key worker yeah. housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Thank and you. gentrification is part of the problem. Yeah. yeah. So every yeah. city all over the world is struggling, or um, and every community is struggling with this. So, so come visit and see how it's done. Yep. Study tour in, in planning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you once again for that thank amazing you. lecture and thank you all everyone for joining us here tonight. Give, give for a minute.